Welcome to step one of your functional health recovery. Increase digestion and absorption. Before we get too far along, let's talk about the four different options you have available to you for your functional health recovery. So often when we start working with somebody, they say, I've tried everything. But when we break it down to these four different functional health recovery options, they realize very quickly that they haven't tried everything. So let's take a minute here to talk about each one of the four different options and make sure that we're all on the same page. The first of the four options is your attitude. The attitude that I'm talking about is your ability to become your own healthcare provider. You need to take responsibility for your entire healthcare picture and once you do that, then power can come to you. The second option you have available in your functional health recovery is lifestyle behaviors. You have to make sure that your day is surrounded by good quality lifestyle behaviors. You're sleeping well, you're eating well, you're hanging out with people that you love and enjoy. You're doing things that make you feel good about yourself and about where you're going. All of these lifestyle behaviors are huge when it comes down to, are you going to get where you really want to go? The third option in, of your functional health recovery will be how much whole food nutrition are you getting every day? You need to make sure that your diet, the food that you're bringing into your body is good quality whole foods. When that is the case, food becomes medicine. And when food becomes medicine, your body will have all the nutrients and minerals and, and carbohydrates and proteins and fats that it needs to rebuild you and to rebuild your health. The fourth and final option you have available to you for functional health recovery is movement. And what I mean by movement is not only just physical exercise, but you getting out of your chair and moving around throughout your day. Because exercise is just one part of movement. When you move, your body uses all of that energy to move your lymphatic fluid around, which really is the main part of your immune response. So you need to move all day, not just exercise, but move so that your body can rebuild itself and bathe all of your organs and tissues with the lymphatic fluid that will keep your immune response healthy. So to sum it up, if you have a good attitude, you're having good lifestyle behaviors, you're eating whole food nutrition, and you're moving as much as you can every day, you have all four options or 100% of your functional health recovery potential sitting in front of you. And so that's what you really have to think about when you are starting your process of getting better and staying better. So consider all four of these options in every area of your life and every one of these 12 different steps we're gonna go through, because if you do that, then your potential to heal is unlimited. Now I'm gonna go through the phases of functional health recovery. There's really three phases to you getting to be the best you can be. The first phase is reducing your stressors. The second second phase is to balance your hormones and blood sugar. And then the third phase is you building your immunity and building your immune system. So as you continue through this process, you will learn that once we get from one phase to the next, your ability to heal, your ability to have good function, your ability to enjoy life will continue to grow. In the first phase, when we're talking about reducing stressors, what I'm specifically talking about is reducing stress to your digestive system. Because one of the biggest problems that we all face that nobody really talks about is how stressed our digestive system is 
And so that's why in the very beginning and in step one here, we have to work on fixing your gut. And what I mean by fixing your gut is if you look at the top left-hand side of this graph, you see that the carbohydrate and food intolerances are at the highest level when we begin. And the fat and protein metabolism are at the lowest level when we begin. So first and foremost, we have to be able to digest carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, and do it in such a way so that then your body can, can start to really rebuild itself using the nutrition that you bring in. The first step in reducing your stress is to do what's called a gut reconditioning plan. And we'll get into that more in a minute. The other thing that you can start doing when you're thinking back to the four options that we had uh, in the previous slide is that you're also gonna be starting to move more, which will include stretching exercises. And then another option you have available to you if you're not eating enough whole foods right now is green smoothies. So all three of these different components of the first phase are necessary so that you can start to reduce your overall stress load and begin to heal. Once the stressors have been reduced, we're gonna move into phase B or balancing blood sugar and hormones because this is absolutely necessary for you to be able to take the nutrients that you're now digesting and move them to the glands, organs, and tissues to allow them heal correctly. We have to balance your blood sugar and we have to balance your hormones in order for those tissues and organs to start to heal completely. The second area of focus in the second phase is to increase your resistance exercise and your cardiovascular exercise. Because when you do that, you're also going to help balance your blood sugar and balance your hormone systems. So everything we're going to be talking about over these all 12 steps are designed to work in concert with each other so that you can become the best you can be. The final component of the second phase, our blood sugar and hormone balancing, is where that little cross is in the middle of that phase. And what that cross designates is where the magic of weight loss really starts to occur. When your carbohydrate and food intolerances are becoming minimal, your fat and your protein metabolisms are increasing and you're starting to burn your fat, that is where weight loss occurs and that's where body composition changes that occur. And that's what most people are really looking for. And that gives them great motivation. Finally, as body compositions start to change, you start to lose weight, you start to feel better, you're having better energy, now it's time to move into phase C and to build your immunity. One of the first things that occur is that your ability to detoxify is becoming better. So it's then that you start doing a purification kind of plan or something that will help your liver clear out all of the extra toxins that you have in your body. The second component of the final phase in building your immunity is to start increasing your high intensity exercise. Because at this point, now much of your inflammation is gone, your ability to move is much improved, so now you can start to increase your intensity of your exercise so that then you can even burn more fat and get healthier. The final phase of building your immunity is to create immune support planning that you can use for the rest of your life. Because the bottom line is that your immune system is the first line of defense for you to become healthy and stay healthy and your lifespan to equal your health span. So now that you have a full picture of what we're going to do over these next 12 steps, let's go back to the beginning. And so the beginning is, what 
is gut reconditioning anyway. Gut reconditioning is a term used to describe the rebuilding of your entire digestive system. This includes all of your glands, organs, tissues, bacteria, microbes, and yeast that are all found throughout your entire gut. But we're going to do it using natural approaches that have been around for thousands of years. But let's start by giving you a simple understanding of your entire digestive system. So your digestive system is a combination of organs that digest macronutrients. And what a macronutrient is, is it's a complete food. And then what it does is it digests those foods down into proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. All of these different organs of your digestive system then work in synergy with each other to break down and convert those macronutrients for the body over the period of 33 to 47 hours. This is the average time it takes for food, once it is put into your mouth, to get digested and absorbed and put throughout your body. But one of the major problems that we all have is that undigested or underconverted macronutrients can lead to a cascading symptoms and problems that we don't even understand and know that it is a digestive issue at all. We just know that we don't feel good. So we need to make sure that all parts of our digestive system are working properly and that is what gut reconditioning is all about. So now it's time for a little anatomy lesson of the digestive tract. So the first area where digestion starts to occur is when you put something in your mouth. And the first area of digestion occurs at your salivary glands. And these are the glands that are inside your mouth that cause saliva. And there is actually enzymes that are there to help you start digestion. But the most important thing about the salivary glands is that it helps to coat your food so that you will actually have it slide down your esophagus more effectively. Once your salivary glands has done their job and coated the food with saliva, then it goes through your esophagus. Your esophagus is a small tube that is made of smooth muscle that actually contracts to allow food to move down so it gets into your stomach. But the esophagus has issues when the food is not coated correctly. So this is one of the first areas where hydration and drinking enough water is so important. Because if you drink enough water, then you have enough saliva and your esophagus works correctly. Once the food goes through the mouth and is coated by the salivary glands, then it passes through the esophagus, it gets to the stomach and the stomach is the first area where digestion really occurs at a great level. We're gonna be talking a lot about stomach digestion, but then as soon as the food passes through the bottom of the stomach, it is going to be met by the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. These three organs and glands are essential for your body to digest foods and break them down from a macronutrient thing to a micronutrient thing. One of the most important organs we all have in our body is our pancreas. Because not only does it secrete enzymes, it also secretes hormones like insulin. So our pancreas is essential for us to be able to have good digestive health, and for good blood sugar health. As the food flows down the river of digestion, going through the stomach, going past the liver and gallbladder and the pancreas, it finally gets into the small intestine. And in the small intestine is where the vast majority of absorption 
of the nutrients that have started as macronutrients and now have been broken down into micronutrients. And so this is where it is really, really important for your bacteria and the lining of your small intestine to be healthy so that you can digest your food and absorb it properly. Finally, the lowest part of the digestive anatomy is the large intestine, also called the colon. And this is where the majority of your bacteria live. It is also where the majority of water absorption occurs and where the toxins are stored before they are relieved through bowel movements. So to summarize the first step of functional health recovery, you have to realize that you are what you eat and digest and absorb. So there's four parts to that. First, you have to optimize your stomach digestion. Second, you have to optimize your pancreatic digestion. The third part is you have to optimize your liver and gallbladder digestion. And then finally, you have to optimize your small intestine absorption and large intestine absorption, which is mainly water. As you can tell from digestion being step one in the foundations of functional health recovery, digestion is considered foundational for health by almost every physician. If you cannot digest, then you're not able to uptake the minerals, the fats, and the vitamins necessary to get healthy. And as we just talked about, there's four basic digestive organs, your stomach, your pancreas, your liver and gallbladder, and then your small intestine and large intestine. As I have talked about already, the digestive system is very much like a river. Problems always flow downstream. So if you start at the mouth and work your way downstream, and taking care of problems that way, then the problems will actually take care of themselves naturally. But so often, people will miss a step, and if you miss a step, it becomes harder to manage the problems downstream. The best example of this, where a problem downstream cannot be fixed until you work on something upstream, is with the use of probiotics. The probiotics are designed to work on the small intestine health. But if the problem that you're experiencing is with your stomach or with your liver or gallbladder or your pancreas, then those problems will continue to flow downstream into your small intestine and wreak havoc. And so it doesn't matter how many probiotics you take until you fix the problems upstream with your stomach liver, gallbladder, or pancreas, those probiotics will not work effectively. So one of the first questions we always get is, do you have digestive symptoms in the first place? And if you do, how severe are they? So let's go through and figure out how severe your symptoms are. And if, if they're severe, what's the next step for you to take to get them resolved. So the first stage is the ideal stage. This is when you have no symptoms. This is when you're a kid and your digestive function is working great. You could not gain weight if you even tried to. Your digestive function is working at its optimum. The next stage in your symptoms is actually called stage one. And this is when the symptom patterns that you are having with your digestive dysfunction and your body composition starts to change and you can't digest the way you used to. This is what we like to refer to as when your organs get tired. They're not actually in a disease state yet. They're just tired. They're worn out and they need some help. The second stage of your digestive symptoms are, are when the labs typically go out of the normal range. This is when you can think about your glands and organs of your digestive tract becoming really sick. 
This is usually when most people start to worry about their digestive health, but you have two stages before this that if you turn around and start working on your digestive health when your organs are just tired, you have much better and quicker responses. The third and final stage of your digestive symptoms is when pathology is actually occurring within the organs. This is when you have diabetes. This is when you need your gallbladder removed. This is when you have fatty areas in your liver. These are all things that occur over a period of time. They don't start this way, but unless you focus attention to them, they will occur over time. So let's talk specifically about the symptom progression in each of the three different types of macronutrients that you have that you digest. Proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. So when your symptom progression starts to occur with proteins, first of course in the ideal situation you have no symptoms. But when you turn into stage one kinds of symptoms, the first things that you'll notice is that you'll have bad breath, you'll have foul smelling gas. Both of these things occur because your digestion of proteins is starting to get weak. Then you get to stage two of protein digestion symptoms and this is when you start to have constipation, you start to have gastric reflux, and you start to have heartburn. Then the final stage or stage three of the symptom progression in proteins is actually when you start to have ulcers in your stomach, you start to have protein allergies, and you can start having parasites that actually get into your digestive tract and start causing you symptoms. The second macronutrient where you start to have symptom progression is when your fat digestion starts to become weaker. Of course, in the ideal situation, you have no problems, you have no symptoms, you are doing just fine. When you get into stage one of fat symptom progression, you'll start to have excess burping, you'll start to have diarrhea, you'll start to have floating stools with undigested fat particles within them. Then when you get to stage two of the symptom progression in fats is when you'll start having light colored stool, you'll start having poorly formed stools, and you'll have occasional gallbladder pain because your gallbladder helps to digest fats, and if it's not being done correctly, you'll start having pain. And then finally, when you get into the final stage, or stage three, of the symptom progression with fat digestion, you'll start having greasy stools, you'll start having regular gallbladder attacks, you'll have colon issues, and you'll also have lymphatic problems because the lymphatic system controls the fat transportation around your body and so if you have a stage three symptoms with your fat digestion you'll also have lymphatic problems. The final micronutrient system progression that we're going to talk about is carbohydrate symptom progression. Of course when you ideally digest your carbohydrates you have no symptoms you're doing just fine. But when you move into stage one symptom progression with carbohydrate digestion, what will happen is you'll start to have more cramping. You'll start to have more upper intestinal gas and bloating. In other words, this is when you start to drink water and you start to get gas and bloating simply from drinking water. Then as the progression of the symptoms go to stage two, you'll start to have inflamed diarrhea. In other words, you'll have terrible cramping, terrible pain, and explosive diarrhea that is starting to occur. The second symptom is that you'll have lower intestinal gas and bloating. This is different than upper intestinal gas and bloating because this is actually occurring in your small intestine. And then finally, you're gonna have poorly formed stools in stage two because your digestive process of carbohydrates is now degradating down and getting worse all the time. Then finally, when you get to symptoms uh, progression of stage three for your carbohydrates, this is when you'll have a lot of brain fog. You'll start having symptoms of IBS or IBD, which is irritable bowel syndrome or 
irritable bowel disorders. And then finally, the last type of stage three symptoms that you'll find that are mostly a carbohydrate problem is what's called SIBO, which is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And we'll get into that more here in a little bit. But what you need to know is that all of these things and all of the symptom progression can and will be corrected and be fixed once we start to fix your digestive function in a global manner. So now let's talk about the pathways of digestion for each one of these three different kinds of macronutrients. Let's talk about proteins, fats, and carbohydrates and what happens to them as they get digested down and then what happens to them if they don't get digested properly. When proteins are digested properly, they're broken down into components called amino acids. And amino acids are vital for your functional health recovery because what happens is when these amino acids get into your body and go around your bloodstream, then they turn around and get built back into proteins inside your body to create muscles, cell walls, hormones, many, many different structures. So it is vitally important for the digestion of proteins to occur, then the amino acids to be absorbed, and then those amino acids turn around and become proteins again inside the body. If this does not occur properly, what occurs is what's called putrefaction. And what that means is that the proteins that are not broken down properly begin to rot and can cause toxic loads to increase and cause you problems with your health in the future. The second macronutrient digestion pathway is that of fats. So when you digest fats properly, they get broken down into what's called fatty acids. And it's very similar to what happens with proteins. When you digest fats properly, they get turned into fatty acids, they get absorbed through the lymphatic system for the most part, then those fatty acids get turned around and get rebuilt into fats inside your body and we all need good fat in our body to store all of our fat-soluble vitamins. If the fat digestion does not occur correctly, then what happens is those fatty acids become rancid. And rancidity is another toxic load problem that your body has to deal with. And if your fats become rancid, then you have increase in your uh, inflammation and it can cause even further problems down the road. The final macronutrient digestive pathway is that of carbohydrates. And carbohydrates are the digestive pathway that most people think about. But when you digest a carbohydrate, what will happen is it will turn into a simple sugar. And simple sugars are the easiest thing for your body to absorb, and that is done mostly in the upper part of the small intestine. But let's say that your pancreas is getting weak, and now you get to the point where you're not even digesting simple sugars properly, then what happens is those simple sugars start to ferment. And when fermentation occurs, this is when you start having even increase in gases, and you start to have a lot of bloating, and you start to create a situation where now the bacteria are starting to utilize some of these simple sugars that should have been digested completely beforehand, and you start having even further issues. Functional health recovery starts with digestion. Now you understand your digestive anatomy, you also understand that your digestive system is like a river, and you understand that the severity of your symptoms really dictates how much time and energy we need to focus right now on beginning this process. So we start with upper digestion. And upper digestion in the stomach occurs when acids and enzymes are used to digest your food properly. There's really two parts, like I said, acids and enzymes. 
The most important acid in your upper digestion is hydrochloric acid. It is necessary to break down proteins, it helps to break down and absorb minerals, and it creates an acidic pH which is necessary for an enzyme called pepsin to work correctly. And finally, it is the first line of defense against bacteria and microorganisms that are found in your food. Another extremely important component of upper digestion is that when you produce enough acid, the valve on the top of your stomach closes properly. It's called the esophageal valve. And when you produce enough acid, then it also allows the valve on the bottom of your stomach to open correctly so that food, after it is digested in the stomach, passes into the small intestine, past the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. So it is really important for you to have enough acid in your stomach. And we've all been told that you need less acid, but that is absolutely not true. We have learned that stomach acid production is the first key feature in your functional health recovery. We've all been told that we've had too much stomach acid when in actuality, none of us have enough. Because stomach acid production is so important for five different reasons. The first reason is, is that it is the first line of defense for your immune system. If you don't have enough stomach acid, you don't kill the bugs, the bacteria, the viruses, and the parasites that come in through your food. The second component that is most important is it begins the digestion of proteins and minerals in your stomach. The third thing that we've all been told that is absolutely something that nobody knew about was that stomach acid production decreases with age, it does not increase with age. So by the time you are 50, you have a 50% decrease in the amount of stomach acid you produce. Therefore, your digestive function is decreased in your stomach by 50%. The fourth component is that stomach acid production decreases under stress. So if you are stressed out, your ability to produce adequate amounts of stomach acid is also decreased, and so you don't digest your food properly. And then the final part of acid production is that stomach acid production is also decreased with the standard American diet. So if you're eating like most people are eating, you produce less stomach acid, not more. Every conversation about stomach acid would not be complete unless you started talking about acid-stopping medications that are so prevalent in today's society. As I just told you, the biggest issue that all of us have is we're not producing enough stomach acid. And we're all been told that we're producing too much, which is absolutely a falsehood. The acid taste that you have in your mouth when you burp up food, is that it is rotting food that you are not digesting. And that your stomach acid is the first line of defense against parasites and other microorganisms, so that if you don't have enough stomach acid, these little bugs make a home in your digestive tract and can make you very, very sick. The other part of acid-stopping medications is they do not allow you to digest minerals to any large degree because you need a strong acid content to break the bonds to allow minerals to be absorbed. So if you don't have enough acid in your stomach, you cannot digest proteins very well, you cannot digest minerals very well. And both of those things are absolutely necessary for you to have a full functional health recovery. The second stop in the river of digestion is the pancreas. And the pancreas is a very unique organ because it has two distinct functions. The first function is that it actually produces hormones. The most important hormone for this discussion is insulin because insulin helps to control your blood sugar. 
The second component and the second part of the pancreas is that it also produces enzymes. And these enzymes start to digest proteins and carbohydrates and to some degrees fat. But because this gland, the pancreas, has so many different functions, it is one of the first areas that start to become tired. And so when your pancreas becomes tired, your blood sugar starts to become unstable, your digestion of proteins and carbohydrates starts to become unstable, and you start to really have issues that start to flow downstream like we've talked about earlier. For this presentation, we're going to concentrate on the pancreatic enzymes because the pancreatic enzymes primarily digest carbohydrates. And so years before insulin resistance uh, occurs, a stressed pancreas will stop producing enough of these enzymes. And so then as your enzyme production starts to decrease, it will start to increase the amount of insulin you produce. And so then you start to have this imbalance that leads to not only insulin resistance, but carbohydrate intolerance. When your pancreas gets into stage two and stage three symptoms, what you'll notice is that there will be two different types of diagnoses that you might be uh, given if you went to a, a medical doctor. And there will also be two types of symptoms that you will notice, and this is how you'll know that this has really become an issue for you. The first diagnosis that you might have is called pancreatic enzyme deficiency. And this is really nothing more than another name for stage two or stage three symptoms of your pancreas becoming tired. The second diagnosis you might have would be insulin resistance leading to diabetes type two. This is done through a test called the hemoglobin A1C test that tells the medical professional exactly where you're at when it comes to how much insulin you need to produce to produce the desired effect with your blood sugar. The two symptoms that you might experience are vegetable matters in your stool, which means that you're not digesting carbohydrates well from your pancreas, and then the final symptom that you might have is light or sweet smelling flatulence, which is also a sign that you're in stage two or stage three pancreatic enzyme deficiency. The third stop on your river of digestion is your liver and your gallbladder. Your liver produces bile that is stored in the gallbladder. When the gallbladder is full, then the bile production slows down because bile emulsifies fat and transports hormones. So you produce eight cups of bile per day in your liver, and then it is concentrated in your gallbladder. So when you have trouble with your gallbladder and it becomes tired, and when your liver becomes tired, the first symptoms that you might have are gallbladder or liver pain. The second thing you might have is a lot of bloating because there again, if you are not digesting your fats properly, then you will bloat even worse. The third symptom that you might notice is floating fat particles in the toilet water after you've gone to the bathroom. The fourth symptom that you might see is you might have light colored stools. This means that you're not digesting your fat properly. And then the final symptom that you might notice is that you might be constipated because if you're not digesting your fats properly, then your ability to have a full normal stool and evacuation of your colon becomes very, very limited and you start having more constipation. The final stop in our river of digestion is the absorption the that occurs intestine in your small intestine very small is degree vital for your large overall functional health recovery. With the macronutrients, your being small your intestine fats, surface carbohydrates, in other words, proteins, how much area there is for absorption in your small intestine through your stomach is about your pancreas, about the size your gallbladder, and liver. 
and being broken Your down into the smaller components all of the nutrients, nutrients that have been broken down which are upstream your fatty is acids, crucial your for amino you to acids have cell sugars in the future once they finally reach the small intestine the majority of the breaking down of those macronutrients into micronutrients has occurred then the absorption of those micronutrients occurs in your small intestine. But one of the main symptoms you will find if you are not absorbing those micronutrients correctly is you will start to have a lot of bloating and you'll start to have a lot of gas. And this is a perfect example of what this would look like because if you're not being able to digest sugars properly or you have resistant starch that is not being digested properly, it becomes the food of the bacteria in your small intestine and starts causing a lot of gas and actually can cause ethanol production. In other words, it can actually make you feel like you're drunk even though you've never had a drop of alcohol. Our final stop in the river of digestion is your large intestine. By the time all of the micronutrients get to your large intestine, they should be absorbed. The only thing that is absorbed in the large intestine to any great degree is water because your large intestine is designed to, to collect all of the toxins with the soluble fiber and then get ready in order to be able to excrete and go to the bathroom and have a normal bowel movement. So only 2% of digestion occurs in the large intestine, but the majority of the absorption in the large intestine is from water. Congratulations, you've got to the end of step one. Digestion and absorption is extremely important for your functional health recovery. And the last thing I will leave with you is that 98% of digestion and absorption of nutrients should occur before the food reaches your ileocecal valve, in other words, reaches your large intestine. So as you have seen, it is so important for all of your nutrients to be digested properly upstream and then as they're being broken down, make sure you have all the components necessary to break them down completely so that they don't get offline. And then they all then get absorbed correctly in your small intestine. And then finally, the only thing that occurs in your large intestine for the most part is the absorption of water. So let's move on to step two. So what do you need to know about step one? Your digestion is like a river. Food flows downstream, and if you fix a problem upstream, you don't have to worry about problems downstream anymore. Your lifespan will never equal your health span unless you're able to digest your food properly and completely. Most of us can digest carbohydrates, but have trouble digesting fats and proteins. Having enough stomach acid helps you digest fats and proteins better and more effectively. And 98% of digestion and absorption is completed by the time your food gets to your large intestine. So all of your digestion and absorption occurs in your stomach and small intestine. 